Welcome to another episode of Nerds Out of Water, the podcast where tech gets real and no topic is off limits. I'm Michael, I'm the CTO from TeamScale, and I'm ready to dive into the tech. And with me, as always, is my good friend David Camus from One Bright Cloud. One Bright Crowd? One Bright Cloud, who's always (laughs) always on the cutting edge of everything from AI to autonomous vehicles. That's right, Michael. And today we're looking at the rise of generative AI. What is generative AI? It's a game changer over the last year, and we've been going to unpack some of the layers. We're going to talk about what it actually is, and we're going to understand some of the good, the bad, and the mind-blowing futuristic, because I think this is going to be quite exciting. Absolutely, David. We'll, we'll explore how Gen AI revolutionizes industries from healthcare to journalism, and we'll, we want to talk about the ethical tightrope that it's walking. Um, whether you're a tech enthusiast or just curious about the future, we want this episode to shed light on how Gen AI is reshaping our world. Gen AI? Gen AI? Gen, Gen something, anyway. Uh, as always, we're not just here to talk, talk tech. We are going to challenge each other's perspectives. We're going to challenge your perspectives. And I think at the end of it, after we've gone through the potential and the pitfalls of these technologies, you can then work out your own mind. So let's get to it. Let's navigate the realm of generative AI. So the definition of generative AI... I'm just going to Google this because I I think this is important. Generative AI is a type of artificial intelligence that creates new content such as text, images, or music by learning from existing data. That's the very short version of it. Um, Why we're covering this today is over the last year or year and a half, this has become incredibly uh, open to the public. It's been... Um, generating a lot of public interest and a lot of debate as well. Um, We've seen large language models um, improve their accuracy and specialization, so legal and medical and creative writing areas. Uh, Image generation has become so real and has expanded into use in creative industries. Um, Audio generation, especially in music and voice synthesis, has grown quite considerably. We find... I've seen this happen in the music industry quite significantly as well as probably some of the bad things um we've increased we've had a hugely increased focus on ai ethics because of this and there's a lot of regulations coming out addressing these challenges along with that of course there's the commercialization of it so making it very user-friendly for non-technical users and i guess everyone here has probably used everyone listening has probably used chat gpt or a similar whether it's bard or um the the other ones that are out there um but there you know prior to chat gpt coming out there was it was pretty hard to run a large language model um as well as that we've seen huge partnerships between AI researchers and industries and the, probably the big one there is OpenAI and Microsoft. So the and but there are other ones and the, some of them are focusing on AI for good some of them are just commercializing it. David why do you think this has become so huge in the last well not huge it's becoming mainstream in the last few years. I think before before we jump into um that can i just try and work out what the difference is uh, and explain to people what the difference is between generative ai and traditional ai yeah, because idea. generative ai creates content autonomously so that's ai creating content for its own learning capability as well as uh, as autonomous generation Traditional AI relies on specific and explicit programming rules. So generative models are trained on vast amounts of data to produce outputs. And as you say, text, music, 
even the entire virtual world. So I, I think we need to really see the difference between the generative AI, which is automation, and explicit AI, which mm. is based on rules. In any of these would you, circumstances. Would you agree with that? Yeah, definitely. So they, they your traditional AI will take an algorithm or a, a way of learning. They'll have a... Uh, they'll have a data set or a model that they're following and they'll try to predict things based on what's in that model. Whereas a generative AI will take existing assets, whether that's text or images or music or voice, and it will use those assets in a training to, to train itself where it can then produce similar sets of words or images or music one of the best or first maybe the first example of of generative ai that everybody uses on a daily basis is is autocomplete um and when we you know when we started talking about chat gpt um it really is just doing autocomplete a lot based on training models um, how it's turned out is probably a little bit more technical than that, but we've we've got a very um, a very long history with with doing autocomplete and using using language models to to deliver on those. And I think one of the reasons why generative AI is really coming so strongly at the moment is because we are really delving back into, if I can say it like that, the deep the, the neural networks and the deep learning capabilities. Uh, it allows for that pre-training and training learning of the modules, whether that be GPT or that the bidirectional encoder uh, representations, which is BERT, and that that will allow and have demonstrated ability to transfer the knowledge um, from the from the general language language understanding to into the specific applications whether they be health or banking or wherever we're looking mm. one of the um, challenges I think we're facing at the moment um, is around deep fakes and misinformation obviously um, being able to create uh, you Anyone can do this. Just log into Midjourney or Dali or what, Stable Diffusion or whatever you're using, and type in you know Nicholas Cage riding a motorbike, and you'll probably get images of Nick Cage riding a motorbike. Now, that's probably a really easy way to do it, but you can use this technology to create deep fakes of deep fake videos of say politicians right saying things that they weren't saying, um, deep fakes of telephone calls from your grandmother asking you for money type of thing so or a child to the grandmother child, yeah, exactly yeah. yeah so the the area of using these um systems to generate these this misinformation and deep fakes is it's becoming harder for us to know what is real and what isn't and there's there's a really good test online i, I don't remember where it is but you can log into this um platform and it will show you images of you know, similar scenes and you choose which one is the AI generated and which one isn't, it's becoming harder and harder and harder. I remember the first time that I did this, it was pretty easy to figure out which ones were the AI. And this was only a year ago. Now it's becoming so hard to tell. Isn't it ever? Isn't it ever? And generative AI is just enhancing that capability. Yeah. It really is learning from what we're putting in. And if you want to look at the easy, simple things that people are doing um, on a daily basis, it is putting a photo up onto a website that that photo of your baby now starts singing happy birthday or mm -hmm. whatever it might be. And that was terribly popular a year ago, extremely popular this year. So a lot of people are doing it. Now, if you can imagine that photo now being taken and turned into a video of a child asking an elderly parent who doesn't know about AI, who doesn't know about using a, a computer or a grandparent, um, there are a lot of negative, true negative impacts mm. that start coming out where people are taking these requesting the money and the money goes overseas and is never seen again. Mm. 
Yeah, or or just a simple one like what were you what were you doing out at this particular place last night when we told you that you weren't allowed to go out and it wasn't it was just a, a fake background. Fake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, uh, and then, yeah. Uh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say there are so many negative capabilities that we're talking about out there mm. and the ethical and the regulatory um, developments around that are really starting to come on. Um, I have an ethical debate on my own head whether this the regulatory should be at a government level, whether it should be at an industry level, um, because in one hand you've got Big Brother taking over and... Uh, reducing the capability. On the other hand, you've got the um, uh, large companies now taking over where we should be heading, Mm -hmm. and both of the ways have their negatives. Mm. Whichever way we go, it has to be global agreed because you can't have one country going in one direction and one country going in the other direction because it'll just end up as people moving countries the same as they do with finance to get out of paying taxes. Did I say that out loud? <laughs> we, we, have, we have a very strong, I think, industry-based ethics, I won't say board, but presence between, you know, there's, there's a lot of really strong ethics industry-based ethics committees around in various various companies. I don't know whether, like you, I don't know whether that's the right place for it. However, I, I, I put it marginally better than the government because at least these companies understand the problem, whereas I don't think that the average politician who is voting on a bill in, in Parliament will be able to understand what, what that means. So we have to look at it from a number of points. We have to look at it from transparency. Is the business going to be transparent? Mm. Is the government going to be transparent? Fairness. Is it going to be fair for all, both at a a corporate level Mm. um, as well as an individual level? And then we have to look at who is actually going to hold people accountable. So if you break a... Uh, an agreement that's made by multiple entities at a company level, at a, are they going to actually hold anyone accountable? Yeah. You've are got, they going to be... You've what, got a, how are they going to hold people accountable? You've got a situation where if, if, a, if an industry-based um, committee creates a, a set of templates for, for what they believe in in terms of ethical behaviour and AI, and then that is different to what the next company produces and there's federal or or even global ethics on on AI. Each one of those parties has an ulterior motive to to do certain things or to not do certain things. Um, You know, we've we've been facing this... Well, it's not an ulterior motive, it's money. (laughs) Money, money, money. Um, Each of these... Each of these dilemmas have been faced in the past with search engines and with uh, f- social media, and now we're facing it again with AI. It, you know, a, a government could choose to um, censor information through learning models in AI, um, which would give misinformation when, when, when queried. Similar to, um, I mean, you know, we will probably come back to this later, but the source data for their learning material is probably where, where is that coming from? Because if that's coming from a skewed version of history or a skewed version of what, what information is out there, then that those responses are going to be skewed and, and also privacy as well. A lot of, I won't say a lot, some of these open source data models have been found to have personal information in them. Um, through prompt hacking, you can actually find rows of data that it, it, it has used as training data, which includes people's email addresses and phone numbers and social security numbers and things like that. So, you know, I think that there's, there's ethical dilemmas from the beginning to the end of this, um, of this situation. Yeah. And, and there's no right way to do this at the moment. And I think that we're in a situation where it's gone so fast that there's been no ability to regulate it either at an industry level or at a government level. 
and hasn't it gone fast? You know, mm. we look at GPT, GPT-2, GPT-3. We look at large data models and large data model sets and LLMs coming, starting to come through. It, it is really just amazing how quickly this is changing now. How, how do you monitor? How do you control it when it is changing so fast? Yeah. It's like the early era of computing and i think we said last week um of the, that's a fortnight ago as this is coming on so fast our regulations are probably six months behind yeah and that is the problem where a government would be able to do so whether we're looking at a business healthcare technology um, personal relationships we have ai that are now building personal relationships mm. both with between people so they're actually saying this person can is a match with this person and also we've got ai bots mm. having personal relationships if i can use the word personal with humans Rep replica is a great example be, of that and and yes. replica is is phenomenal in terms of what it can and shouldn't do but is that a bad thing Again, it comes back to ethics. Like if you're if you're a lonely Japanese guy sitting in an apartment working twelve hours a day, and you have no one to talk to, but there is a a an AI that can actually make you feel valued and wanted, is that going to help stop a, a form of mental illness or a suicide in the future? Or does it actually pull people further away and create? Mm. It's a hard one because you want the you want the AI chatbot, the AI human replica to be able to start talking and involving people with other people. Um, GPT four and Dali are really quite exciting, I think, and they have certain rules in place to ensure a human is protected. Um, are they enough? I don't know. Mm, couldn't tell you. I mean, the other part of this is which industries are they, are they, is which industries are AI being pushed into? And there's a, there's a, um, internet meme that's out at the moment saying, you know, instead of, um, instead of creating new art and writing new literature, why isn't AI going out and fishing all of the plastics out of the ocean? Or giving a, telling us how to do it. Exactly. We, we try so hard, and I had the conversation this morning as I opened my light and easy because yes, I'm on a diet yet again, mm. and my light and easy, and I've got plastic upon plastic upon plastic, oh, and I'm yeah, thinking about that. hundreds of thousands of people are doing it, and don't don't get me wrong, if you're using light and easy, it's really worth it. Light and easy are trying very hard to reuse plastics and to use plastics that are positive and reusable. So mm. I'm not going to pick on, but any of those packaging like places, mm. it, I suppose it doesn't really matter. We buy, we buy a headset or a telephone and the, the plastics and the capability, all of the, the, the parts of it, um, of the, of the boxing is just so much out there mm. but that that's me going off on the tangent yet again uh, and if anyone knows our script we have a very basic script to go off <laughs> and we started with the script really well and michael started talking about the script and keeping to it i literally just went off on a tangent no, and i'm fine. somewhere down the middle of the end and we're now bopping all over the place but it it's this is fine. the way I the mean, chat that's, goes. That's the way the chat goes, isn't it? Um, that is. A but, it, I mean, bringing it back to the topic, it, it, you know, those are the things that we need help with. We don't, I don't, I mean, my personal opinion is we don't want, humans don't want AI to be taking the jobs of people who love doing what they're doing and do it for nothing because they love it. Musicians, artists, Screen oh, yeah. screenwriters, um, anybody in the creative industries is looking at this, going, "Oh wow, I don't even, I don't even have to do do anything anymore." And then, on top of that, we've you know, uh, let's just put this back to the music industry. We've got a eighty thousand songs being released on Spotify each day. I'm sure probably half of them don't get actually past the past the muster, but that's fine. But then that's going to increase because now 
there are people who will just use GPT and some, or some sort of generative AI to write lyrics and then another form of generative AI to write the music. And in theory, someone could just set up a system that just writes music and writes songs according to whatever prompts they give them, and it could churn out 80,000 a day just from that one AI. So, so let's delve into that a little further. Let's look at AI-generated music and AI-generated lyrics. Do you have any thoughts on whether those um, song writers, AI, uh, do they just pop up and then disappear? Or are they like, uh, do they stay in the top numbers for a while? You know, obviously you're looking at someone with, you know, heavy metal background, Saxon, Led Zeppelin, Iron Maiden, mm. and you, th- you can exactly tell the years that those people had their, that those groups had their really strong time. Mm. And I don't want to look back on AI as taking over the music industry continuously. And I'd like to know if the AI music pops up, goes out and comes back, or the people who are promoting it do. I, my thoughts on this, and I've, I've released music using AI, um, both in the music generation, the lyric generation, and the instrumentation. So it, it the, the goal, I think, is that everything is a good tool, but if you make it do everything itself, it turns out rubbish. Um, mm-hmm. it, I, I don't, I don't think that it's well at at this current point in time. It's not able to generate great lyrics. It's definitely not able to generate good music. It's able to generate an approximation of what something might sound like if you asked it to write a Saxon song from nineteen sixty three, nineteen sixty eight. And um, and use lyrics from the 2020s, it would probably come up with something that approximated that, and then you know it it would it would give you an idea. But I don't think it does. I don't think it can complete it at the moment. But I don't, I don't think it's far what far off. The thing that we're seeing so what about- is the, is the voice generation. So you can now sing and I'll use that word in quotes, sing a song over top of any music and use anyone's voice. Um, and we've seen a couple of songs get quite a lot of um, traction. We've seen Grimes do a public, uh, you know, here we go, here's my AI generation, my, my AI model. You can use Grimes AI to t- sing like me as long as you as long as you include me as a, as a co-writer and and um, you have to do it through our system. So in some ways, people aren't embracing it. In some ways, people are just uh, using it <laughs> using it to create a pile of rubbish. But um, And then there was another one that was released a little while ago that had, uh, I think it was Kanye West or Drake or someone on there that shot up the Spotify charts but wasn't done with any sanction or permission and therefore Spotify had to pull it down because it's in theory a copyright breach however the companies that made these systems available and it's probably moving on to another topic but the companies that made these systems available are in a way um, encouraging that copyright breach because they uh, they have already used all of that information without the permission from the artist to create um, a, a model that people can use. Um, it, it's the same with the large language models. There's no permission for any of the major literal, literally literal works that have been put into um, into OpenAI's model or in any open source model. Um, no one's gone out and said, "Hey, can we use this?" And in some cases, they have, and they're promoting it like that. However, um, I don't think that there's going to be uh, much of a it, it, in today's in today's status, I don't think there's many AI models that are purely from uh, material that has been that has permission to be used. Um, and if there are, they're, very good point. Yeah, and I mean you can create. But people, pe- you can put you can put you know create a create a, a Monet or a Picasso in you know under under three seconds. 
Just I'm give it very a good at doing that. <laughs> but that, that, you know what you're saying is you would prefer it to be used to enhance creativity at the moment rather than create the creativity. Mm. So Absolutely. you're looking at enhancing the what you're putting in, which is what I think is is, is strongly yeah. I strongly agree with that at the moment. Whether that be in art and music, but specifically with you, you're looking at a, a, an art point of view, and or even we'll talk even about- for example, this podcast. You know, we we both went in and got ideas for what we what we want to talk about. We're not following that. <laughs> <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> it's a tool to give us prompts to talk about stuff. And That's right. Previously, we would just would have used Google for that. So, it's yeah. the same situation. And same situation, just used differently. And then we'll, we'll talk about some misinformation in a minute. But mm. um, before you go on to that, you've spoken about music. I, I'd like to speak about um, the uh, medical industry mm. and the healthcare industry because the advancements in using generative AI right across the industry is just being amazing. But whether that be in medical Im- imaging and being able to take images of a heart and being able to look at one's heart to find out what the problem is and then the AI actually coming back and finding things that a human eye would not have, that's that's taking it to the next level with high resolution images Uh, and drug discovery. If you now put on generative AI, you use quantum computing. We use yes, no, maybe to start looking at generating and understanding drug development. Mm. It happens so quickly. Mm. 10, 20 years worth of discovery now can be done in days, if not minutes. And, and that will increase our capabilities of providing medical cap- uh, uh, care. Mm. But does that come along the lines of, and I've got to be careful here, because the more care we give people and the better we make people and the more healthy we make people, the more people that are on the planet. Mm. The more people on the planet, the more degradation the human race creates to the planet mm-hmm. and the quicker the planet will well we'll just look at all the storms that are going around at the moment and what's yeah. causing that it's got to be humans but why can, we now need to look at ai to tell us how do we stop global warming how do we reduce um, maybe it's stopping the oil and increasing the knowledge of battery operated capabilities to stop them catching fire and that sort of thing but anyway why not even go there i um, mean if if, but, if we put our full-on paper i mean tinfoil hats on at the moment you, you know you talked about the pharmaceutical industry i need a tinfoil hat <laughs> i need a tinfoil hat because we mention it every time and the, the, i promise you next time we have this i'm gonna have a tinfoil hat so we can use it there's a there's a you know <laughs> the in general pharmaceutical companies won't make drugs for condition or they won't put put a lot of money into researching drugs for conditions that are not profitable for them that's a, that's a commercial reality it's not even a conspiracy it's like if if there's a disease that's out there that affects maybe two out of every billion people then they're not going to worry about it right whereas yep. this technology will allow us to create and test these drugs for minority of people or for people in poor countries it will allow us to produce and te- or test and produce these drugs for a much lower cost and in theory in, in in a utopian environment that is a great outcome but in a commercial environment that's a really bad outcome because we're you know again if we've used generative ai to somehow produce a recipe for a drug that will that will help or cure a condition that is only affecting poor areas, i.e. they can't pay for it, then number one, how do, how does it become commercial? And number two, how do they patent it so that they can That's charge totally it on? Um, my, my biggest concern about this is, is not necessarily the... I know that we can do it. Um, there was an article I was reading just the other day about a, a company in Japan that created technology to tell um different baked goods apart because 
in Japan, they don't like, you know, to, you to grab their food and put it on a, you know, put it, and they don't like packaging. So if you grab a croissant out of the cupboard and put it into a bag, then they kind of, you know, it's like, oh, someone's, someone's touched that. And so they created this technology to, to be able to tell a croissant from a, from a muffin and pick up the muffin and charge them appropriately while, while the person behind the counter provide, does chit chat. I think that's great. However, that technology was then used to identify cancer cells because it, the way that it worked was very similar to how, how, it's, how you can spot cancer cells from regular cells and what type of cancer cells they are. So I, I just think that, you know, we, we need to keep pushing ourselves in whatever direction because we never know where it's going to be get, get used. And I know that that's a, you know, that's probably a giant leap and it's not necessarily generative AI, but it's, uh, it is traditional AI where, you know, we're doing image recognition. But these, these And things- just to be careful, everybody, we are not connecting eating muffins with cancer cells. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be eating muffin. <laughs> I thought you were uh, nice and easy. <laughs> You're nice and easy. Oh, have muffins. Nice, nice and easy. Nice and easy muffins. Um, yeah, I agree. Hey, um, nice and easy. Sponsor misinformation. Us. Sponsor us, nice and easy. Sponsor. We probably should use their correct name, but anyway. Uh, light, is it light and easy? Is it <laughs> light and easy? Uh, okay. Well, easy maybe. and light. But anyway, yeah, well, yeah. misinformation. We just use some misinformation by creating the wrong name. But AI, generative AI, now has the capability of developing false narratives, spreading face news, and manipulating public opinion really quickly. Mm. Like, I can create an article, send it out onto every single social media, and a couple of videos and a, a news announcement from a couple of the channel top channel people, and I can start sending that out. And that misinformation will travel. And it doesn't matter how quickly different social medias suddenly realise they need to turn it off because it's already out there. Mm. People are already talking about it. People have copied it and started sending it on. So and that's deep fake sort of... T- that's right. That's deep fake auto-generated capability will can have a complete change on people's perspective of the world because I'm providing and I'm disseminating misinformation. Mm-hmm. Now, we can talk about ex-American presidents with fake news. What is fake news? Is fake news what we see or what we don't see? <laughs> That's just it. And At the moment, it's so difficult to tell real news from fake news apart. I mean, I, I open a news site and I look at it and... I just, um, I, you, you can't believe anything. You have to do. You, yeah. I, I, I don't mean to, don't mean to spout the typical conspiracy theorist words, but that. do your own research. But it's like, just opening, if opening news dot com you and you go, huh, that doesn't sound right, and then you have to, then you end up in a loop, in a you know loop or a rabbit hole of trying to find out is that actually right or not. And I think that that one of the things that we've lost in the past ten years, maybe, is journalism or traditional journalism, where true journal, yeah, true journalism, where you're actually making sure that the source is correct, and you're confirming stories, and you're you're you know you you've got a level of confidence that this is a, an actual true story. Like you said, we can just generate a story, post it to all the social media outlets, post it to all of the traditional media outlets get it out there and someone's going to pick up on it because if it's bad enough news, then everyone wants to know about it really quickly. And, um, you know, there's been some situations where bad or bad fake news has been picked up by major outlets. And as soon as they've picked it up, everybody else picks it up. And even when they put a retraction in, there's always the underfunded, um, News but I, I, I can create those news outlets. Yeah. Those those top news outlets, I can take some screenshots and suddenly got the get an article, a video taking of, mm. of them talking about my fake news. Yeah. And that's how easily, and then people start to believe it. But with AI and those news outlets you were talking about, um, news.com, whatever, they look at what news articles you read 
and oh, they yeah. will pr- specifically go down and give you those news articles. Yeah. Not the news articles of the world. You're in but an what echo chamber. You re- yeah. I'm in an echo chamber. We're in an echo chamber. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, bias is a huge thing with, with AI because it has been with social media as well. Because if, if I yes. go to my social media, if I go log into my Facebook or my Instagram, I see stuff that is different to what you would see. Um, and it's probably different to what someone who is in Asia, Asia is a big place. Let's say, you know, they're in Manila doing some, you know, they're working for a call center doing some, um, Facebook stuff with their friends, that's vastly different to what I would see and de- definitely hugely different from what you would see because you don't log into Facebook. And AI bias is now also a problem. You know, it's been a problem mm. for many, many years. We're trying to get over it through facial recognition and understanding that different ethnic capabilities and different colour skins use and require different um, biases. And, and we have to input those biases as a training uh, and now with generative AI, we have bias detection. Mm-hmm. But is the bias detection bias itself? <laughs> uh, it's really hard to understand yeah. how those potential biases start moving on. And considering the various demographic groups and the tools for matching disparate impacts uh, of that analysis I- mm. is essential. And that AI will really start to... Um, if you put a single piece of bias in, all it'll do is propagate and get bigger, mm. especially if the generative AI is training itself. Which in most cases you, you would do. Like, I mean, if you're creating an image and you want an image of the same person every time, you need to create some training data and therefore you yep. use the AI to create the training data. And, yeah. you know, you create 12 different images of the same person and then you would cut out the ones that don't look like that new person, generate 12 more, do the same, come up with a data set of 10, 10 images that look like the same person, use that as training data, do the repeat, repeat, repeat. And then, you know, you you end up with training data that's been created specifically to be biased towards that particular person that you were trying to create. One of the government entities around the world, and I don't know if, how widely advertised it, the actual government entity is, they um, they have in their logo a single pixel missing. Mm-hmm. And that single pixel is missing on every single one of their letterheads, logos, whatever you might call it. Natural fact, AI cleans that up. Mm. It doesn't find it, it finds that single pixel, says it's a mistake, and cleans it up. Yeah. So if you try and copy their, uh, their their currency, the AI actually creates an error by fixing it up. Really clever, where people are trying to go and trick AI. Yeah. Exactly, and I mean, there's a there's a uh, project out that. Um, for image generation that allows you to create an image or doesn't, sorry, if, if you are an artist and you have created an image with, without AI, you can embed this software into your image. It makes very minor changes to colors and hues and stuff like that so that when that is used as learning data, it cannot be used. It, it doesn't know what it is. And they've gone one step further with this and can now actually embed bad code into a learning model. So if you've got a, if you've painted a picture of a lovely, lovely scene by a lake and that gets ingested as training data into a model, it will be an elephant. So when you type in, give me a picture of an elephant, it will show a picture of a large lake. And that's what people are doing to confuse things. <laughs> well, now you've stepped on to AI being used in negative capability. So let's talk about cyber threats and how cyber uh, AI and generative AI is looking at negatively impacting our mm. cyber threats. So we have malware now that is literally AI created 
we have multiple emails that will build up a single malware within a computer, but you have to go to a site multiple times, uh, or you have to go to a site a single time. Uh, long gone of the days where you pick up a USB on the ground and you go, oh, what's this? And you plug it in and before you even know it, somebody has c- capability of taking over your computer. That was back in 2000, 2010. Now AI will take over your computer and you will think you are doing it. And AI is actually social engineering you to create the wrong way of doing it. And... It's a real worry about how, how the AI is working in the background of, of a computer that is actually giving a, a social, a, a negative impact to the world. So you're providing the information and it could be privacy. Mm-hmm. It could be attacking another computer via your computer and using inver- inversion attacks to be able to exploit those vol- uh, vulnerabilities of the machine learning, which is where you were heading down a minute ago. Mm. And, uh, you know, with the, the amount of, mel- of just basic phishing messages, I won't say emails anymore because it's messages, it comes through SMS, it comes through WhatsApp, it comes through everywhere. I get probably three or four a day in my Facebook Messenger account, and they're all very targeted. They're all very um, sophisticated. I, you know, we, I get messages from clients who just, is this for real? And you can ninety with ninety nine percent assurance, not even look at it and say no, it's not. <laughs> um, I don't know if the opposite side of that is keeping up at the moment. I mean, I certainly know that I report everything that I see that comes through to through my email or through um, social channels or through direct messages, but I don't know if they're keeping up with it because it, it still comes through. It's still getting worse and worse. And th- there is a, a, a very, you know, there are very sophisticated anti-spam or anti-malware or anti-phishing systems that try to identify these things. And I know that they're pretty accurate, but I, they're, the hackers are always one step ahead, it seems. Or and they have, ahead. and you know, we have had this through the hard drives being delivered to um, to certain countries around the world, and the hard drives were delivered as brand new with malware already on it. Yeah, we've had um, we've had foundries, uh, specifically uh, aluminium foundries where the spinning of the aluminium has gone through the roof and created a, uh, a, a, an implosion of mm. the plant. And we can talk again and again about electrical companies and transition companies. They've all been attacked in varying ways. And at the moment, we've gone, we seem to have gone off of that sort of area into personal and privacy data. Yeah. And it just worries me now that people are hearing this, not even on a daily, on an hourly basis, that Mm. another company has released personal private data. Yeah. Are we becoming very, very abrasive to it? Do we care? Are we just going, ha, another one? Who cares? My data's out there yet again. I have a theory that it's... It's really one. I have a theory that it's a generational thing. You and I probably have, have been have lived in a, in a world where we've had we've lived in a world where where we've had privacy and we don't share any of that with with other people but the generations that have been born with the internet especially have very little awareness of what their privacy means and what losing that privacy would would mean and do you remember curling the phone cord around your finger while you're on the <laughs> on the on the landline? <laughs> yeah. Yes, you're right. I don't we want to did. sound like I don't want to sound like a grandpa, but it, it's it's very oh, much in the my same. day. Back in my day, we didn't even. Yeah. <laughs> Back in my day, but the you know the it, it, maybe it, maybe it doesn't matter to the, the the newer generations because they just realise that all of their stuff is out there anyway. I mean, half of. I'd say 90% of the stuff they've put there. So it, it, is it really a problem or is it just a problem for us old guys? 
Yeah, you see, I was thinking it was the complete and other, other way around. I was thinking that us old guys are going, <laughs> we don't really care. Our data's there somewhere. I'm sure the bank's got it sorted. And the new, the young guys are going, oh, we need to protect, protect, protect. It's interesting. I had never thought about it. I'm going to ask a few people. Mm. If you have a consideration, let us know what age group you're in and write down below. Mm. Let us know. Call us are you on, an old, on an old guy stage where you do care or don't care or a young guy stage where you do care or don't care? It's scary because, yeah, I I kind of do try to protect privacy. I, I try, but I know that I'm facing facing an uphill battle there. Whereas I, I, I find that, I won't say all, but most of the people that I know that are a lot, you know, more than 20 years younger than me don't give a crap about their privacy. They'll just put everything online. Job displacement. I'm going to jump. Mm. Job displacement. I have a view that job displacement is a here and now issue where different AI modules of different capabilities, whether they be computing, Steam, or whatever, have come in. They take over a few jobs, and people train themselves to become different and to do new jobs. That's my belief. I believe that this is going to just be another job displacement where a certain number of roles will move, but we will still need people but in new fields it could be a 10-year a 20-year group grouping but that's my belief can i ask what your thoughts are i think so too i think that we've got a situation where you know the printing press came along everyone complained that it was going to take their jobs it did for about a small period of time and then everyone started doing other things then the then the uh the industrial age did the same thing and machinery took over jobs and then etc etc um the internet came along changed the world as we know it a lot of people went out of jobs you look at the traditional newspaper now it's pretty much gone um maybe it's not maybe it's still out there but i i don't know i used to be a paper boy i don't think there are paper boys anymore (laughs) um uh the oh that was a bit boring the yeah. idea was you were meant to be negative to me. No, that, that, that I, no one's going to be interested if we both agree. I actually agree with you there. It's not a. It's not a thing that I. I you know, I'd. I'd love to be able to go. Hey, no, that's not the, the thing that I. I was going to say is, each of those situations has had a huge lead up and has been a very long, drawn out process of implementing, say, the printing press and the factories and the internet. This is a year, like it's, it's happened in under a year. Mm, mm, I mm. think the same will happen. I, I, I personally think that generative AI has just become part of our lives now. It's not even something people think is an amazing thing. It's just there. Um, I don't know how many times I hear it in a week where people just go, oh, don't worry, I'll just get ChatGPT to do that. Or I'll, don't worry, I'll just, here, I'll just get that done by such and I'll do the research here. And I think this is where government and training institutions need to be on the front foot Mm. because there should be a fair and ethical transition for people. And if that's not there early, then people are going to miss out. I heard a lot of um, jobs in uh, in what used to be calls, uh, sorry, what used to be sort of the low cost development industry so you're looking at countries like india and the philippines and vietnam where the, you'd have developers that were doing you know seo or minor website maintenance all of those people have now become prompt en- engineers so they're just working on prompts how do i engineer a prompt wow. to be better and oh, oh. you know that i think that's where my um my cre- my creative side comes in and goes. Well, you don't. You just use it to get the information, and then you do it yourself. But they, you know, they they they're getting to the point where they're using these um, prompts to write whole articles, and 
if they can fine tune those those prompts, then they can get it to write that write those articles ad nauseum, and that's that's why we end up with so much spam on our our uh, our systems. And you know, nine, well, I think Jack- nine out of nine out of the I'd say a good four out of ten articles that I re- that I see come up in my in my social media feed or my Twitter feed um, have been generated by by AI. I think that number is probably a little bit higher, but at least four of them I can tell it. Yeah, that that's pretty. That's a pretty shit article, and I don't really think that a person would have written that because it's just so bad. <laughs> And we look at chat GPT, sorry, we look at GPT-3, not chat GPT, GPT-3, um, the number of parameters that are on it, I believe at the last count, if I do a quick Google, is around about 200 billion parameters. That's a lot of statements that somebody can start training and understand what the answer should be and getting it through. And I mean, education. To, to, uh, well, just to talk about the, you know, you mentioned. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're talking about th- version three or three point five, but there was a there was an article that I read a day ago that said when ChatGPT three point five was released, it was the highest, you know, the most funded, the most, um, mo- most of the engineers working on there are the highest engineers in the AI space and everything, and they, it's the cream of the crop, and then here we are a year later when most open source models will be able to achieve the same amount of creativity and accuracy as GPT 3.5 and four. Had uh, had we put a black box around that and, uh, and manage it without actually quelching people's desire to increase it. Mm. Yeah. And uh, my thought on that is, um, I, there was a conference last year that I went to, you know, when, when chat GPT four was released, that already had it working for months, uh, probably even, probably even a year. I, I think that at some point in time, when the ethics get sorted out or when the regulatory thing gets sorted out or when just people accept it, they're just going to go straight to GPT eight and it's already there. Um, you were going to talk about education. Yeah, I was. Um, I, I was talking to my daughter the other day. She's 14. And one of her friends was really upset that at the end of last term, she submitted a what she thought was an excellent response to a question or in a subject. I don't even know what subject. She had typed it into ChatGPT. She had got a response. She thought it was good. She copied and pasted, and she got marked down. Mm. I agree with that. She shouldn't mm. copy and paste ChatGPT. And we've spoken about this before. You and I would go into the library. We'd go through the encyclopedias. We'd take out text, put it in, put it into our own words. So there's got to be a way of inclusive of ChatGPT or one of the GPT-like capabilities, one of the AI learning capabilities, and use that within the educational model. Uh, I don't have a response. I don't have an idea at the moment. Do you? Well, yeah. Well, what are your thoughts? It's the same. It's the same as search engines. As soon as you know, twenty years ago, um, kids were copying stuff off just random websites that they found and pasting it, and teachers knew knew no different because they didn't know how to get to those websites. Um, now it's now we're looking at ChatGPT where they can generate an article and it obviously doesn't sound like, you know, if you've got a 14-year-old kid writing a paper or a response that doesn't sound like a 14-year-old kid, then something's wrong. But again, it's it's the same thing. Use it to research and use it to find the situation where, you know, the, the dot points and the summary and then use that information to write your own response and form your own opinions. Um, I got a, back in 19, when I was a kid, um, I did a report on um, Pearl Harbor and 
most of my information I got from one source, which was a person who, who was there. And I used a lot of quotes from that person and I, most of the opinions, well, there were no opinions. It was more of a factual based thing, but I still cross check that against other, other things that I found in the library and stuff like that. Um, and this is all pre-internet, but I got marked down because I used one source or one primary source, source. Mm -hmm. and it was, and it was very biased towards that one person's experience. Um, it's the same when you use ChatGPT. You're just you're getting it from one source. You're not you're not going in and cross checking. In my opinion, kids should be taught to use ChatGPT to find the information and to check the information. So, go into if you've got a if you've got a report that you're going to do, go into a ChatGPT, learn how to write the prompt to get the the right information that you need, and then ask it, what about other points of view? What are, what other points of view haven't I thought about? And then research those. Get on Google and look for the papers and look for the references, um, and then come back with your own thoughts and your own your own language, um, because I think that that's what's going to make our future generations more intelligent. Hmm. And I think we've had plagiarism, plagiarism, uh, plagiarism uh, scanning capabilities or detection tools for many, many years. Yeah. Now we just have to increase our capability of AI detection models and AI detection software. And they are out there and the universities yeah. and some schools have them. And I think we just need to increase those capabilities. The problem with that is it puts another a grab, piece of... A Grammarly subscription and that's got... Um, Grammarly? That's got plagiarism detect them in there it, it's fine yeah, it's yeah. like but does it have ai does it things, have it? does yeah. it have ai generated concept plagiarism it, see that's it where i'm thinking generate that's the wrong. content and it Ooh. can check the plagiarism but i want to stop the ai sponsor us Grammarly. stop yeah we'll come back Grammarly, and we'll help you out there um actually between you company and mine i reckon we could come up with a really good tool with that one but we need to foster some sort of culture where the intellectual um, and the critical thinking of kids and the critical thinking of being able to develop and pull out information from um, GPT is really out there because that's, that's where we need to be. We need to get to that point. Um, but and that's hey, going to help with the misinformation as well because, yep. you know, we the, the best thing... The best defense against any of that misinformation or phishing attacks or poor, crappy writing is humans. We actually have the capability of saying, you know what, I don't trust that, and having a look to think, you know, making a decision. Um, we've talked a lot about the bad stuff. Just quickly, you know, there's some good stuff as well, isn't there? There's always good stuff. There's always something out there. So we spoke about medication. We spoke about um, how um, the medical industry is looking at creating new medicines to go forward. We also talk, spoke briefly about um, creativity in uh, music and the art industry. Uh, we've now touched on education tools and how the content is going to be much richer and the children are going to come through. We now look at AI in the capability of learning self-driving cars. They're out there. Are we going to look at scientific capabilities of making those cars fly? Are we looking at... Where, where do you reckon we're going to go? Bum, bum, bum. The I just went completely off your track. Have, no. <laughs> the, no, the capabilities we have are just so phenomenal. Like... It, we can it it seems like it's a, re a thing that we do every day now but where we've come from and where we've got to in, in a very short amount of time we've we've got so far and i just i just think that in the future i, I in, in five years time i don't even know what it's going to look like because if we continue at the same pace it's going to look very different the the world and and how we see it is going to look very different to what it is now I get it that there are organisations and and um, ethics committees and 
bad actors who are trying to make this not work. Because if it does work, we are moving more towards a utopian society where, you know, we have a universal basic income and people can just do what they love rather than having to go and, you know, do a 12 hour shift in a factory five days a week. But just, just creating um, an environment that is sustainable and can be, um, you know, can, can be predictable as well is going to be important, I think. I can tell you, I listened to one of our early, early podcasts, pre-COVID podcast. Wow, was there such a time? Mm. And one of the predictions I made then was that in my life, we will see the land spaces that are 100, 200 kilometers outside of cities increase in value as auto autonomous flying vehicles and autonomous flying taxis start going in and out of the cities. I'm going to stand to that. I still think it's going to be a thing in my lifetime. Yeah. I don't know about flying, but, How's that? you know, flying is obviously ah. the thing that we want to try. So going back onto what you were talking about, positive uses, um, we've spoken about the... We, we need to think about really positive things about fraud detection. So with AI comes an increased capability of fraud detection, whether it be in finances, whether it be understanding what deep fakes and whether the deep fake is a, a deep fake or not a deep fake. Oh, my God, AI, mm. talking at AI. But other places like the marketing um, and, and the supply chain, that's a really, really obvious one. Look at how Amazon are using Industry 4.0, how they're using autonomous robotics to completely 24 hours a day deliver packages. I can, deli I can order something now that will be delivered. Uh, hold on, what's the time? Oh, it's before midday. I could get it delivered either this afternoon or tomorrow yeah. morning. That's just yeah. unbelievably quick. And so that, that whole supply chain of from understanding what the demand might be to delivering the product is, is majorly positive. Uh, and I'm not so sure about some of the customer service AI capabilities where mm. we're now talking to robotic people and whether I like the idea of pressing one or saying yes in my country. Um, but yes. I, the, the, I had oh. a conversation with a guy the other day who I questioned, are you an AI? Oh, and? He, he was a real person, but he said, do I really sound that bad? And I said, no, you really sound that good. You are saying Ooh. what you're saying is very scripted. And your voice is very even, and your words are pronounced perfectly. Therefore, my brain interprets it as an AI. AI. Poor guy, you mean me? Who was trying so hard, and you? It, <laughs> yeah, I think if somebody like, said that to me, I would be offended. I just, I just think that perhaps because I deal with it so often, I get, I've my bias has gone further in one direction than it should have. I, I automatically assume that something is AI and then look for reasons that it won't be. Rather so than I'll throw, I'll, I automatically assume that it's a real person. I've put off a whole load of statements about positive things. Have you got more? Um, <laughs> efficiency is obviously one of the things that we're going to look at in the world today. You know, we produce a lot of um, waste, um, yep. not just in fuel, but in food, for example, we produce a lot of waste in those plastics that you're talking about. If we can identify ways to pull that waste back and use it better, um, that's going to be, a, a, it's actually going to benefit companies and make them more profitable, I think. Um, so that comes to business optimization where, you know, we can make decision making algorithms that, use existing um, learning data to predict what 
things might look like in in if they you know if we do this product or if we change this product in this way this is what the outcome is going to be i mean i've i i used to buy a particular mustard because i could use that mustard jar as a cup afterwards or as a glass they changed it to a screw top lid probably because it maybe costs them 30 cents less or per product but I've stopped buying it, and so have a lot of other people that I know. Um, With food waste, though, we have to understand that a human needs to realise, and we've been really trained, that a fruit has to be perfect, a vegetable has to be perfect. We have to change the ability of humans that a carrot is never going to be a perfectly shaped carrot. A mango is going to have spots on the outside, yeah. but the inside is going to be amazing. Oh, yeah. And humans need to realise that, especially Western world, um, that our two you major, talked about, three major talked about the, the delivery cycle and how how that how shipping stuff is 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 in changing the way we ship stuff and the the, the, the supply chain. We need to shorten that because. You're right. If you're able to accept a mango that has spots on it, but it's amazing inside, then you don't need to go to a supermarket which has had it shipped, you know, three from three cities over where it's been delivered by an airplane from another country, because those that's you know, right. Those are the ones that came out as perfect. Well, I think our major um, supermarkets look, we've here had- in Australia should be um, oh. clearly identifying. What is Australian? What isn't? I do not believe they do that. I thought well they did for me. Well, I don't think they. I, I look I always, at the fruit section. I always and I've see got that. No idea. Oh, okay. Maybe I'm oh, blind. Really? Blind. I'm Sup- old. Supermarkets. Let's just go down one thing. Supermarkets probably one thing we should cover in a future episode because I think that that's going to be popular. Um, I don't know how that relates to technology, but. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think so. there's plenty in supermarkets in the supply chain we can talk about. And I think another thing that we should talk about soon is AI and the climate change. And we should really delve into environmental monitoring and how how the positive is and how the negative is and how AI can be used positively to play a really important part in making a substantial um, positive practice. There you go. Another idea. Another idea. Um, with that, I think we should wrap up for the day. Um, I thank you, David. I really, I think this conversation was pretty stimulating and I've learnt a little bit, so that's good. If you like our podcast, click down below, press the click, respond to us, talk to us and listen out for more.